Well, hello, everyone. This is Wendy Rose Williams, and this is the Waking Up Spiritually podcast. So happy to have you join uh, Greg Kirk and me for our twice a month podcast. We're here the second and fourth Sunday at noon uh, Pacific and 3 p.m. Eastern. And you can find all the archives at wakingupspiritually.com of the past episodes. And you can also join us live in our Facebook group by the same, uh, by the same name, Waking Up Spiritually. I'm a past life adventure guide, and I help people release energy that no longer serves them. And also find those past life abilities or abilities from earlier in this lifetime that you started to develop that are just amazing and wonderful. So pulling those forward to present time too. And I also do future life progressions. So, so happy to have you here with us and I'll turn it over to Greg and he'll introduce today's topic. I'm Greg Kirk. Uh, you can find me at gregkirk.com. It's spelled G-R-E-G-G-K-I-R-K.com. I'm an energy healer and worker. I help patients with uh, mainly chronic illnesses, but also spiritual blockages, energetic blockages, so forth. Um, I do that through remote sessions, or I have a, an office in where I live in Connecticut, where we, we can do hands-on treatment with uh, tuning forks, a, r- a very Reiki-like situation. Uh, I also run an online group healing circle every Sunday. It usually happens prior to this broadcast, and you can come join us there if you would like to be led through a, a remote um, meditation that's for healing. And uh, when weather permitting, which is not now, <laughs> we do in-person fire circles in, in this general New England area. So we it's a s- similar kind of online group healing circle thing, but we gather around a fire. And, um, and uh, yeah, obviously it's where we are now, this is, uh, you know, January 23rd in New England. It's, it's way too cold. It was like 17 degrees out this morning. So a little too cold for that, but soon. So um, Wendy and I uh, listened to you, the listeners. <laughs> a listener came forward and said, kind of looked at the expanse of what Wendy and I have been doing. Wendy and I are coming up on two years of doing um, broadcast every two, roughly every two weeks or twice a month. And... Um, this listener said, I, wow, you, you have a lot of stuff and, and your, your broadcasts are, are long, so I can't possibly listen to all of them. Can you give me kind of a breakdown of, of all of your episodes or what, what's kind of your survival guide? You know, you, you guys, your theme is to help people wake up and stay awake and then move on. Um, what, what's your top 10 things that you do? You, you know, what, what, are, what are your go-to crystals? <laughs> you know, what, what are the books that help wake you up? We've done episodes like these, entire episodes on, you know, what are our favorite books or what are our favorite crystals, an entire one on spiritual protection. But today we're going to um, consolidate this, but also give some new spins from, it's not going to be a rehashing in any way of past broadcasts. We'll refer to those, but, you know, Winnie and I have grown since we, we've done some of these episodes and we've have, you know, some new things to say about about these suggestions. So we're calling it a spiritual survival guide. I'm going to pull it up now, the the deck, so that we can uh, all see it for those of you who are watching on video. And of course, those who- I think I need to subtitle it, the things I wish I knew then that I know now. (laughs) Yeah, right. Um, Okay. Can you see that, Wendy? Yes, that's great. Okay, good. All right, spiritual survival guide. So we're defining this as um, a brief, helpful, practical guide. Practical being the pivotal word to help anyone wake up spiritually, make sense of your awakening because it can be a confusing time and to maintain being awake. That's steps one and two. Step three is moving on, You know, becoming comfortable with your awakening and, and, and testing out some of your new knowledge and abilities that you have. Um, we're providing a set of tools and recommendations on every level of this experience. And, you know, like I said earlier, it's a consolidation and simplification of many of the points we've made in past episodes, but it, not, not by any means a rehash. And it is uh, a, a listener requested um, topic today. So we're happy to go, very, very happy to get the feedback and the suggestions. Um, this guide is going to contain three sections, understanding your awakening, how to stay awake, and then how to progress. 
So uh, is there anything, I'm sorry, Wendy, is there anything you'd want to- That's perfect. That's a great uh, foundation. Thank you, Greg. Cool. So uh, Wendy and I have both gone through what we call shake you to wake you experiences. So this is how awakenings tend to happen with people. They're, they're, sometimes they're an easy transition, but honestly, um, it, these experiences tend to be like you're minding your own business. <laughs> you're going about your daily life and you're in it and you're doing fine. You're enjoying it. And then something unusual happens. And for me, it started off with, um, you know, I had, I had a dream where I actually saw somebody um, reaching out to me in the dream. And I reached out to that person by phone and that person said, hey, I actually did try to reach out to you. And I thought, wow, that's that's interesting. Um and then, uh, so that, that was an easy one, but then things got more weird. I started feeling stuck in my life, quote unquote. Uh, I started having bad, quote unquote, things happening to me. I was being, I didn't, I couldn't read uh, the energy at the time. I was being pulled away from being told by my guides, more or less, that the, the path I was on was not the right one if I wanted to progress spiritually. So, you know, kind of rough things were happening in my life until it all culminated with a very debilitating disease, you know, Lyme disease. All of that was information that it, at first I was not reading correctly, or I was, I mean, actually, you can read it one of two ways. Either it's, it's going to make you upset and, and think, why me? Or it's, you're going to look at it objectively and say, okay, these things are happening in my life. What, what's going on? What, what should I change in my life to so I can avoid these things in the future and, and learn from them. It's not just about, you know, punishment coming your way and, and you're being punished because you're on, on the right, on the wrong path. It's more about like learning about what was going on. So, um, so some people early on, they have psychedelic experiences. So they, they do uh, drugs to, to make them feel a presence outside themselves. Other people have what's called, you know, labeled as religious experiences, sometimes you just feel a presence bigger than yourself and have a, a big moment of awakening, a supernatural experience. Some people are visited by UFOs. I mean, some people are, it, it's a full range of experience. Um, and it's, it's not because you did anything bad. <laughs> it's it's uh, not necessarily because you did anything wrong. It's just information. That's the best way to look at it. Look at this information without any judgment and try to really get to the root of what's going on with it. So one of the things that helped me um, make sense of these things were, were I just accidentally read a couple of what I call mind opening books. So the two pivotal ones for me were Many Lives, Many Masters by Brian Weiss and Journeys Out of the Body by Robert Monroe. Those are pretty basic books to, to explain to you that you know, in, in the case of Brian Weiss's book, uh, he, he it was a hypnotherapist and he started finding that people that he hypnotized had had traumas in lives prior to the one they're living now. And that these traumas informed some of the difficulties they were having in this lifetime. You know, for instance, if somebody were hung or were drowned in a previous life, they had breathing problems or they had neck problems or even thyroid problems. And he documented all this. And that was I'd never heard of anything like this when I read this um, in the late 90s. I thought, wow, this is an interesting idea. Journeys out of the body goes even further. Robert Monroe just accidentally developed the ability to leave his body. He take his consciousness out of his body and move it around. And at first he just moved it around the earthly plane, but he went all the way out. He went to the astral planes, to the you know, areas where, where people die and where, where they go when they die. You know, there's all kinds of different planes of that. So it's, that really opened my mind. And I just, so this was early on. I read these books. I wasn't really having any kind of supernatural experiences myself at the time, but this kind of opened the door for me, opened the, the door in my mind of like, wow, th these people, they're not crackpots. These are, you know, Brian Weiss is, is a cr credentialed uh, physician or a practitioner and Brian and um, Robert Monroe was, he was a successful businessman. He, didn't, he had no reason to write about this stuff. This, in a way, could have really hurt his, his career. But, you know, so I pay attention to those things. So that 
very early on in, in the awakening, it was a, sometimes it helps to have a, a mental opening of the mind on top of everything else. Because if it's just you have a, a wild supernatural experience, a lot of people think they're losing their minds, that they're, you're going crazy, that the experience wasn't real. Not so. And then um, another thing. So after I had read some of these books, I was I became intrigued with psychics and and the idea of Reiki healing or energy healing. So I took some of those sessions, just kind of dip my toe in the water. You know, whenever my normie friends would see, hear about these things, you know, they would be like, what are you doing? You know, what what's are you going crazy? <laughs> you know, not so much with the psychics. Everybody's probably had some level of an experience with a psychic or they've been intrigued by them. And I would just say, be careful, you know, because some psychics are not legit. And some of them, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't waste your time at them. Uh, but so I would, if you are interested in your, in, in your awakening, look for a psychic who is highly recommended, has legitimacy. And, and there's, Many of them out there now who have websites and, you know, look for those that have the testimonials and these people are, are into healing as well. Because if you, the whole idea of fortune teller, there's a big difference between a quote unquote fortune teller and somebody who can do a reading for you. Worlds of difference. So um, that's, that was my awakening. You know, I, I, those were some of the experiences from my awakening. So let's move to Wendy. And what she yes, just one one comment, Greg, on the Robert Monroe and the astral travel. Yeah. Uh, my my belief and experience is we all have that ability, but yeah. what was different and unique was he was consciously doing it. Yeah. So because we leave our body regularly when we're sleeping, we're dreaming at night, we can be traveling to the astral plane and traveling different places. Um, and same when we meditate too, when you reach this yes. really deep level of meditation, but over time to start to feel yourself either leaving your body and, or feeling yourself popping back into your body. And this can kind of tie in with that sleep paralysis feeling too, because your soul might be out of your body at that time. And you're like, Oh, what's going on? Why do I feel, why do I feel paralyzed? What's happening here? To so. back up what you're saying, you're absolutely right. We all go, we all leave our bodies when we're sleeping. And um, to, to this point, Robert Monroe, when, when night, in fact, some of us go to classes. <laughs> this is a fascinating thing. So he left his body one night and, he, and there was a group of people. And one of the teachers was like a light body person who doesn't really look human. They just look like light in a human form and came up to Robert and said, oh, hi, Robert. Good to see you again. And and Robert said, what do you mean? He said, oh, you're, this is the class that you come to like all the time. And they said, oh, um, are you on drugs? You're not sleeping? And Robert said, no, I'm not sleeping. And then they said, are you on drugs? <laughs> no, I'm not on drugs. Oh, and then they were like, congratulations. You're able to consciously, you know, move out. And they said, would you like to come to our class today? And he said, no, I just, you know, I accidentally came here and th that was interesting. So uh, fascinating. He, he had a, all those really cool experiences. So anyway, I'd like to pass it back to you, Wendy. Th thanks for bringing that up okay. though. You're, you're absolutely. absolutely right. Yeah, it really is interesting. And I think those things start to happen when we start to integrate our subconscious with our conscious waking self. And it's like when you're having a really vivid dream and then you're able to turn it lucid yes. and you're starting to just be empowered and just to have some control of it and make better choices in the dream rather than just, you know, simply you're being chased or, you know, it's like this stress dream where you're just, you know, getting rid of fears and worries, which is useful too, right. but it's just starting to become more whole, become more yourself, mm -hmm. which also happens when you learn how to ground your energy and really be in your body and clear your energy and start to raise your vibration, which Greg referred to and just was using some different terminology as he started introducing today's topic. Right. That those concepts of grounding and clearing your energy and raising your vibration, some people call it protecting themselves or establishing uh, clear boundaries. That, that's a great way to look at it too. Um, those were game changers for me and starting to learn how to differentiate your own energy from other people's 
or from the collective, uh, that just really, really changed everything. So you can look for some of our uh, specific podcasts if you're intrigued and like the idea of grounding your energy, really being your body, really being on this beautiful planet that we have the privilege of living on, and also clearing your energy to just let go of energy you don't need, emotions that you don't need. Uh, you can look for those, those earlier podcasts on those. Um, and again, just starting to differentiate, being really sovereign so that you're in your own unique energy, because that's what we're meant to do. And we're not, we're not here to carry all this baggage and just drag all this old baggage behind us. We're not meant to be Sisyphus. Sisyphus was uh, cursed by the gods and he had to forever roll this huge, heavy boulder all the way to the top of the mountain. And just as he got up to the top of the mountain, it rolled back down on him again. And that can happen to people when we're, we don't know how to release things. And when we're trying to carry everyone else's load too, instead of working with them as a friend or a parent or a sibling and, and helping inspire them and helping empower them so that they do their own work too. Because you cannot force that horse to drink the water. You know, you can lead the way if you know where that wonderful, beautiful uh, river is, but you can't, <laughs> you cannot force its head in there. So personal, personal choice, it's free will. So healing my chakras was huge because I didn't even know what chakras were, but I was so intrigued. And when a spiritual teacher helped me feel my chakras for the first time, the root chakra on up through the crown. And she helped me spin them and just get them moving and get them more uh, right-sized and healthier. Uh, that made a huge, huge difference for me. And that's what got me intrigued in becoming a Reiki master. So like Greg, that was kind of like my dabbling my toe in the water. And I went for a session or two with a Reiki master um, that was a coworker. And he was also um, a psychic medium. So it was perfect because it was like a two for one for me um, to just get that healing and be able to get that reading information at the same time. Uh, so that was, that was a big deal. Uh, so working with someone like Greg or I that can help you with that, you can also, um, again, go, go back to some of our earlier podcasts. I also uh, got some help in identifying and balancing the four major elements in my body, fire versus water and earth versus air. Four is just such a, such a critical number of balance. If you think about the four directions, the four seasons, it's just so important for balance. And what I discovered um, as the spiritual teacher was helping me with them she asked me my impression of my fire versus water. And I said, I think I've got so much water. It's put my fire out. <laughs> I'm just exhausted. <laughs> and she agreed and said, that's what was going on. And that was kind of my natural propensity. So we had to just thank my water, but really work on uh, building my fire to get that, get that more balanced. And I also had lots of air energy. Um, once I did wake up spiritually, uh, and got some good information and some readings and healings and read some great books, it was pretty easy for me once I learned how to connect with my guides. And I learned I was doing that all really naturally, but I was not in my body. I was not here on the planet. I was not uh, connected to the earth very well at all. Uh, so getting more of that earth energy really improved my health and it improved my ability to manifest in the physical so that it wasn't just this beautiful, airy, fairy, lovely visualization and theory that was like too way out there. Um, so that, that made a big, big difference for me. So again, aligning with my higher self, learning how to align with my guides. I was just, once I first heard the concept of guides and I'm like, what, we can get help? <laughs> We don't have to be doing this all ourselves. I'm not supposed to be Sisyphus all the time because I just was feeling crushed a lot of times. Like I just kept putting all this effort in and then um, that, that huge boulder would just flatten me 
um, again and again and again. So I just had to learn how to spiritually surrender and to call in my guides and learn to trust my guides. That was just a really, really big deal. Uh, because if anything, I was uh, a little um, overly independent and just didn't have didn't have good trust. Uh, so again, uh, spiritual teachers and healers helped me helped me with that. And that was just a big deal. So then I got to the point where like, okay, I want to meet my guides, I want to know more about them. Uh, and then things just started to uh, cook along from there. Um, so much better. Uh, just so, so grateful for that uh, big, big step of leveling up and developing a daily spiritual practice. And you can find uh, one or more podcasts on that topic, whether it's meditation and meditation doesn't have to be hours a day. I occasionally still meet people who say, well, I don't have time to meditate because you have to do it at least three or four hours a day. And I'm like, why? I just, I, I want to be respectful, but to me, that's, that's old school. If you're called to do that, that's beautiful. That's fine. You know, if that's your focus, or if you're going to like a 10 day retreat where you're meditating all that's wonderful, but people that are not starting it and not doing it because they feel they have to do three to four hours a day, let it go. <laughs> just blow up that, that, um, um, teaching or belief or whatever that is, because you can have a meaningful meditation in five to 15 minutes. I mean, yes, it's wonderful if you've got an hour and you can do that, you know, once or twice a week and kind of kind of vary it, but just do something daily, I think is a really, really uh, big, big deal and just so uh, uplifting. And it helps us do these things. It helps us ground and clear our energy and raise our vibration and find our own center and just feel so much better. Or maybe for you, it's yoga. Maybe it's writing and writing doesn't have to be, oh, I'm going to write this 400 page book and, you know, share it with the world. If that's your calling, fantastic. But maybe it's just writing a journal for yourself. Maybe it's writing down your dreams and even if you feel you don't get a lot of information there, just starting to write it down, you'll just naturally start to get more. So here's a nice uh, one pager slide that I will uh, read for people who are listening and are not able to see the PowerPoint. And we do invite you to come visit wakingupspiritually.com so you can see the PowerPoint um, if that's uh, helpful for you. But accepting your divinity just finding ways to feel good about yourself is really important and not believing in loss or gain, just getting to that neutral, that objective observer, as Greg said, just getting to that uh, place of neutrality. And even though life might be super challenging, because that does absolutely happen to all of us, just being able to uh, level that out the best you can. And also to not be overly uh, willful, not my will, but thine, um, referring to uh, a greater power, referring to the creator, uh, so that we're not in our ego of, it has to be done this way, meditation must be three or four hours a day, or you're not doing it right. <laughs> Those sorts of, um, you know, stubborn, stubborn um, will, um, or us not being willing to surrender to our guides and to the divine, and putting my hand out, because guilty. I definitely went through, uh, I've been through periods like that where I just was really struggling. And forgiving all betrayals. Oh my goodness, what a path to freedom. And as you move further along that, you start to realize, oh gosh, there really isn't anything to forgive at all. And you're just able to kind of up level from there and it just becomes more of this natural natural state of being. And that includes yourself, being able to forgive yourself and just start each day fresh uh, the best you can and not be carrying around that old, old uh, baggage, as I said. Being able to uh, view the ego impersonally, it's just a part of us. And I love that expression um, that the, the mind is a wonderful servant, but a terrible master. 
because you don't want your left brain, which can be uh, just filled with fear. You don't want that, that egoic um, self uh, driving the bus. It's like, I want my, my heart and the rest of me. I just want to be a full, complete person where it's not just like left brain, left brain, left brain, um, firing all the time. And you'll know when you're doing it because you're not only fearing some fear and anxiety, but you're feeling um, just like, like you're going in loops, uh, just endlessly going in loop. Do I do this? Do I do that? You know, just endless loops and you're not able to relax. So just take that breath and just work to trust. So being able to feel it more impersonally. Um, I, I know when my ego is trying to um, bug me or even to the point of torturing me. And I know it's time to just take a time out and sit down and I try and just view it as kind of like, um, often it presents as like my five-year-old self or like, like a little preschooler self. And I just say, what's scaring you? What's bothering you? What's bugging you? And that's a useful conversation because then I can figure out what it is and just give myself a hug, so to speak, and just, you know, thank the ego for, it's just trying to keep us alive. But when there's not a saber-toothed tiger in the room, um, it can just it can just relax and just come along for the ride. Uh, having faith in the support of the invisible realms, that's a big one. Um, I've referred to several times talking about trust and faith. And also accepting your death. And I put death in quotes. And that's actually going to be our next podcast topic, because what does that really mean? Because our soul is eternal. And many people have gotten to... Well, I'm going to leave it at that because we're going to get more into that next time. So anything to add to that, Greg? No. Well, one quick thing about meditation. I agree with you. Some people have these preconceived ideas about what's, what is successful meditation and, and they've tried it and it, it was too hard. So they say, I, uh, you know, I can't do it. Yeah. Another misconception I see a lot is that you have to completely clear your mind of any thoughts and that's, you know, next to impossible, <laughs> you know, unless you're a, a master. So the idea is with a meditation practice is what's called stillness practice. So you reduce your thoughts, you stop moving, you stop your action of your body and your brain. And that just that has a healing effect because you start to become in tune with the other worlds, you know, the, the positive things. So anyway, that's, yes, that's just, just quick. finding that calm and peace. That's why some people meditate just by simply observing their breath. And yeah. just notice, okay, I'm breathing in. And then, you know, if you choose to breathe in calm and peace or whatever you choose to breathe in, and I'm breathing out and you can do it that way too. And then it just slows everything down. And people that are just super active, super hyper, or might have ADHD or might have that left brain that just does not want to settle. Don't torture yourself if you can't lie down and meditate do a walking meditation, just spend 15 minutes having a nice walk with no agenda, you know, preferably by trees or water. And that will help you accomplish the same thing. So again, don't have this preconceived notion of it's, you know, no thoughts. And I'm like in this one position for three or four hours, because that's pretty unnatural for most of us. Right. So I'd like to talk a little bit about how I stayed awake, which is an important stage. So having the experiences of awakening is one thing, but then we'll, it, there's this kind of bridging of how do you make sense of what you're, you're going through and then maintaining your higher level of whatever, thinking, awareness, all these things. So um, one of the things that I did was I noticed that after having my experience, experiences, some of my big experiences, it helped me to keep a better frame of mind and my vibration higher if I stopped engaging on, in, I'm calling it mainstream life routines, but, you know, let's talk about it, like diet, for instance. I stopped eating fast food. <laughs> it took me a while, but I did stop eating fast food. That's low energy food. There's a lot of toxins in it. It can physically make you not feel well if you stop eating it you're just gonna start feeling better already. The other thing is watching certain things on TV. They warned us about it when I went to Brazil for, um, for healing. They said, stop watching horror movies. 
stop watching the TV news, stop engaging in negative social media groups where everybody's arguing and yelling and trying to prove a point. These, your energy just gets sucked out of you. If, if you're doing engaging in these things on a regular basis, you're gonna lose the good feeling that you had from your awakening. Uh, so, um, so because of this, people had told me, well, if you really wanna maintain your, your higher vibration, engage in a daily practice. And this is what, what Wendy was talking about in, in her slide. Yes, it, you know, so think of it this way. If you're interested in your personal health, you stop eating bad food, right? You go on some sort of a healthy, uh, it, there's a life change that you experience where you just start eating healthier food if you're interested in your health. Another thing a lot of people do is exercise. Of course you should exercise. Movement as we know and strenuous movement builds your muscles up. That's good for you. You know, it gets your heart rate down, your breathing, you're, you're gonna live longer. If you eat right, what will they tell you? you? Eat right, you get enough rest and you exercise, you're physically gonna live longer because that's a healthier lifestyle. There's a fourth thing to do, daily practice, some sort of stillness practice, uh, a meditation practice. practice. Um, what I do today is uh, actually some Kriya yoga poses. These are uh, what, one of the things that bothers a lot of people is they have energy leaks. So let's say you accidentally do engage with somebody who sucks the energy out of you, or you get in an argument with somebody, a you know, relative or whatever, and you walk away from it, you feel depleted. This is the perfect time to do uh, some of these yoga poses or a meditation where that you, you ask, you pull your energy back in. So in, important stuff. So just as much as you're doing, imagine this, I call it spiritual hygiene. But it, you know, if, if you're going to the gym or doing some sort of physical exercises every day or every other day or a few times per week, you should do the same thing with some sort of a meditative or you know, energy hygiene practice. And then I continued uh, reading spiritual books. So I, I, I stopped reading the fiction books that I liked before. It doesn't, it doesn't you know, doesn't, you can still in, engage in love and, and watch movies that are fiction and so forth. I, it is, I'm not saying don't do that, but my um, frame of mind changed and I, I was more interested in hearing about people who were going through the things I went through, you know, and, and um, or hearing from people who are already on the other side of this, who had advice on, on, on what to do about your spiritual awakening, these practices and so forth. So that's, I, I you know, I read books like, on a Grandmother of Jesus, Un Untethered Soul by Michael Singer. These are all really, really good books to, to help you maintain your, your cognitive high vibration level. So this, this has a part two for me. The other aspect of this, and Wendy talked a little bit about this, and of course we did an entire episode on spiritual protection, but it's very important to protect your energy. So whether it is I, I, you know, I refer to it a little bit in the last slide. Don't engage in things where you know you're losing your energy, where you're having energy leaks, but protect your energy because people who start to have awakenings start to notice when you've been spiritually attacked. And you, you'll notice, like if you wake up, you know, from a sleep where you just feel like, wow, I had a really bad dream. That didn't, that felt real. You know, maybe there was something going on on the other side. So one of the things I recommend doing is before you go to sleep every night is just ask for protection from Archangel Michael. Now, not from a religious standpoint, Arch Archangel Michael. Archangel Michael has been around before religions were even invented. And our, his, his role is to help humanity. So literally, right as you're going to bed, just say, Archangel Michael, priest, please protect me while I sleep. All you got to do. That's it. Um, I'm, I'm going to skip. So if you're looking at the slide, my number two is talking about the star, five-pointed star meditation. I, I, I'm actually going to do a quick two-minute to show you how to do that. So we're going to skip ahead to crystal protection. So Wendy and I did an entire episode on what crystals we like. And the ones that particularly help you if you are in their presence or even wearing them are selenite, shungite, and obsidian. So just... Do you have any other uh, crystals that you like to use for protection in particular outside of that, Wendy? 
No, that's great. And it's funny you said that because sometimes I don't even know what they are. I just pulled the two that are out in my pockets right now and they're both uh -huh. like a dark protective. Um, and that's just, it's just like, I, you know, I look, I look at like, okay, what's on my altar, what's on my shelves. And like I said, I don't always know what they are, but those were just the ones that were supposed to go in my pocket today. Good. And Excellent. another day, uh, one of my friends, she would just kind of laugh and she had this small collection of the smallest ones. And before she went into the office each day, she'd look in that bowl and say, okay, who's going to work with me today? <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. And just have some you know, sense of humor about it. <laughs> right, right. So here's a recommendation. If you're getting ready to go into a meeting at work or you're going to um, have lunch with somebody who's been kind of an antagonist of yours, you can actually, you can do the five point star meditation. I'm going to uh, men mention here in a second, but a quick thing you can do, let's say you're caught off guard and somebody comes around the corner. Oh my gosh, here's, here's Fred and Fred and I always have, <laughs> have trouble talking to each other. You can very quickly just imagine an orb, whether it be white or gold, doesn't matter, a, an orb of safety around you. Just and just imagine it, what, make it form, and then put your entire energy inside of it and just know that that's gonna protect you. Just, just that quick thing that you can do is, it, anything you imagine on the, in the physical realm happens on the energetic side, always 100%, I, I'm telling you. <laughs> so just your imagination as you think it is of an orb around you creates a real orb around your energy body. So just know that you have that ability. Everybody does. You don't have to be a master or an energy worker or anything. You can do it. So um, one of the things that I recommend, obviously, is to contact Wendy or me if you feel like you've been attacked by anything or you've got some energy leak that you can't you know, heal on your own. And then it's recommended to go to a practitioner who do things like Wendy, Wendy and I do where we, you know, we, we remove things. If there is an attachment, you know, Wendy looks into the past lives. I do a bit of that as well, where maybe there's a trauma or there's something that needs to be brought up and addressed so that you can heal. And these, these energies start moving again. And then the final thing is you may want to do a space clearing in your own home. And, you know, th these are fairly easy to do too, uh, through smudging, which means Usually people, you, and you know, if you have a Whole Foods or uh, near your house, Whole Foods sells little smudge, you know, a uh, sage smudge, um, sm you know, they're, they're wrapped up, they're, they're little and big ones. So, so it's basically sage that's specifically bound up that you can light it, make it smoke, and you just put it in all the four corners of a room where you feel the energy is not right. You can put it on yourself, like, you know, move it around yourself so the smoke gets on you. And I just heard something the other day. I think if sage burns for 20 minutes, it's actually an antimicrobial. So it kills um, germs in the air as well. But if you, I'm telling you, you just gotta be careful because if you leave it smoky and you're in a small room for 20 minutes, you, your room's gonna become a smokehouse. You know, it's gonna be pretty wild. But anyway, so smudging, toning, which is, is chanting or, using chimes, you know, chimes, uh, tuning forks, singing bowls, and so forth. So that's something you can experiment with, you know, if you've got a spiritual, um, what, do, what do you call these shops? These shops that sell singing bowls and crystals and so forth. If you got one in your town, go check it out and look for chimes. And again, you do the same type of thing. You go into the corners of your room with these chimes and this, this will clear and raise the energy. Am I forgetting anything, Wendy? Uh, you can use a bell. You can use a drum. Um, I do it with prayer. I just repeat the thank you angels clearing prayer as I go through the whole whole house and work my way, work my way through. Um, and that orb of protection, it is so powerful. And I think it's just part of us uh, being empowered, keeping our sense of humor, like you said, when you don't want to run into Fred at the water cooler. <laughs> right. um, and it's, I, I had a great experience with that when I was first taught how to do that. And I was working one-on-one -on -one with a spiritual teacher and she was teaching me like how to gently with her permission, go into her energy and how she could go into mine and then also how to block it. So she told me, she said, okay, I'm going to kind of like come at you 
um, to kind of like startle you. And the scenario is I want you to shield yourself. So I did. And she looked really surprised and she took a big step back from me. And she said, what did you just do? I said, oh, I just pictured being on the Starship Enterprise. And I went shields up. (laughs) (laughs) Good. So it's just, it's just, again, it's not about being in fear. It's just about uh, taking care of yourself, honoring your own energy, knowing what's right for you. But it was very effective. Um, And I mean, she could really feel it that much that she had to physically uh, take a step back from me. Yeah, Um, And I was was kind of startled by it. Stuff is real. So so let me distinguish between something because I'm, I'm going to do a quick visualization now. It's not really meditation, but I'm going to walk us through the five point star um, ritual that um, so I equate, you know, the orb of protection, kind of like a shield that goes up. Uh, this five point star meditation is like putting on armor. So you can do both. So, I mean, you know, we all know the knights had armor and shields, so it's totally fine to do both. This one takes a little longer. The shield's up orb like Wendy does. That's instantaneous. Okay, but so this is what, what you do. Uh, get somewhere where you, you can just kind of close your eyes and, and visualize your energy body. And if you can't visualize it, then just imagine your body kind of floating in space. And imagine it, it like the Vitruvian man. So if you're watching the video now, there's a picture of the v- Vitruvian man. This is the man that... Um, Leonardo da Vinci drew, you know, hundreds of years ago. And what the position of the man is both arms straight out vertically and legs out spread eagle position. So they're a little bit past shoulder length. So it's like you're ready to do a jumping jack. So imagine your body like that floating in space and now pull your consciousness back from the body, maybe about six feet. So you're seeing the back of you in this spread eagle position. Now you're ready for this, it's perfect. So just above your head, in the center of your head, maybe, you know, eight inches, visualize a little dot of white, and then move down your body to the right side. Don't do anything, just we're we're traveling down your body just visually, down past your right foot, okay? Go past your right foot a little bit, so that you're gonna draw a line that will encompass the entire right side of your body, except for your your arm. So let's go back up to the top of your head. You've got a dot up there, and now you've got a dot, also a white dot below your right foot. So now draw a silvery line of protection and, and draw it, like take some time to make it go all the way down to that dot just beyond your right foot. Excellent. Now you've really created a wall right now, a wall of protection. That's a real thing. Now we're going to visualize another dot. This dot, imagine, is just a little farther out from your left hand. Your left hand, as we know, your arms are both stretched out to the side. So there's a dot just outside your left hand. And from just beyond your right foot, we're going to draw a silvery silvery line up to the dot that's outside your left hand hand. Perfect. Now you got two lines. Now we're going to visualize another line or another dot. This one is just to the right of your right hand. So the line that we're going to draw. So first visualize the dot. Very good. Now start drawing a line from your left hand dot over to your right hand dot. Very horizontal line, straight line going all the way to the right hand dot. Excellent. We got three lines of powerful protection. Next dot, and the last one that we're gonna draw is just beyond your left foot. Just like we did with the right foot, this time it's just out and below the left foot. So visualize a dot there, and the line that you just drew ending with just outside the right hand, that dot we're gonna move, we're not gonna move, we're gonna draw a silvery line moving down to the dot just below your left foot. Excellent another wall of protection. And now the final line is gonna go all the way back up just above your head from the dot that is just below your left foot. So start drawing that line from below your left foot all the way up above your head. So I did this very slowly and methodically. You can do it much faster. The point is you need to do it mentally. 
starting from above your head and going down, just as I described. So once you do that, you've created the five-pointed star meditation. Nothing that we call evil can bother you. Um, and like I said, this is like physical armor. So this is a great, great thing to do if, you know, if you, if you are, for instance, like a workplace, let's say you're at work all day and just having a hard time with everybody you work with, do this thing, <laughs> you know, and then you can do the orb too, but doing them both is actually very effective. So let's move on, Wendy. Yes, it brings in that sacred geometry too. Just you know the, the the shapes that are that are coming in because that's what that's what everything's composed of. Exactly. So, question of how do you remain on the path? Uh, what was really important for me personally was being able to heal and release past life energy. I have stopped counting um, how many past lives I had to work with um, in in detail. But that's what was important for me. It's it's various levels for different people. I'm consciously aware of more than 125 or so of my past lives. And I just kind of um, laugh and appreciate it whenever uh, a healer or a friend or someone tells me, oh, gosh, it looks like this is presenting for you. It's like, yep, I've been working on that. And that kind of helps me put the put the pieces together. And you absolutely can find the lives to celebrate and embrace and pull forward those past life abilities. For instance, some of us, many of us served in mystery schools, what were called mystery schools, where you spent a lifetime learning incredible, beautiful uh, skills and abilities that may sound like fantasy, that may sound like science fiction, uh, may sound really out there, um, but they can be very real. Um, so I, I often think that people who do that sort of writing or make those sorts of movies, I think they are being inspired by what they learned in, in past lives and past life memories and, you know, can come to them as a dream. And they're like, oh, I had this great inspiration. Now I'm going to write this um, script. Uh, you know, this television script or this movie script. And I think it's just kind of downloads from the divine or from their, from their past lives. So uh, it's really been a big, big part of my path, which is why I love to help other people do it. And recently I've started offering, I'm facilitating future life progression sessions. And those are fantastic because it helps us get a better outcome now and in the future by being able to uh, travel in that way. And it makes sense because time is a wheel, time is continuous. Uh, we just use past, present, future as a human construct for simplicity. So what was critical for me uh, to remain uh, on this path and to uh, keep, keep going and grounding and clearing my energy and raising my vibration was I needed to establish new boundaries. And that was really, really critical for me. So when I was having a hard time uh, with, with you know, Fred at the water cooler, uh, Greg's example, you know, times a million because it was an immediate family member or it was a spouse or it was a child, uh, you know, those really are your, your, wonderful opportunities that may not be feeling very good at that moment until you get the right boundaries. And sometimes we all find with, with relatives, with uh, friends, sometimes it's time to just love them from a distance and just really to minimize or, or cut off um, all contact or, you know, if you do go to that occasional once a year family reunion and you're happy to see 99 people there, but, you know, Fred just does need to be avoided. <laughs> just, just put yourself in that um, uh, wonderful um, protection that, that Greg mentioned. And again, um, practicing forgiveness and trust. That was huge for me. Uh, I don't see that as something we accomplish uh, necessarily in a lifetime or easily. Some people are just simply better at it than others. And they're just, just you know, typically a, a well-balanced 
forgiving person. I'm not saying they're doormat. You know, they know how to stay in their own energy and stand up for themselves because they've got those good boundaries and they're standing in the love of their own heart uh, and just surrounded by that. Um, but I needed to, I needed to work more on forgiveness, definitely of myself as well as of others. So guess what? Therefore, I created a lot of situations like that, where I had to practice and learn the skills. And it became the theme of my first three books, even though they're very different. Forgiveness is absolutely a theme going through them, because as I said, it's a path to freedom. Um, so, and again, uh, just restoring, restoring that trust, because I, I really was struggling with um, trusting the divine. And that's a pretty... Um, it's a pretty sad place to be. It's a pretty hard place to be um, if you're not able to, to trust in the divine. So I definitely had work to do in that area. Also, working to heal and balance my masculine and feminine energy has just been a big deal. And you can just be, you know, too much in that, in that left brain, or you can be just too much in one energy or the other, uh, and not able to just uh, just kind of seamlessly flow back and, and forth through them. We all have both types of energy. So the right side of our body is our masculine side. That's the, the active, the giving side. The left side is the feminine receiving side. They're equally important. Uh, you know, they're both, they're both a part of us. So yes, we may be uh, born and we're identifying as as male or female or many 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 other places along that continuum. Um, I mean that's certainly uh, been changing a lot on um, the last couple of decades. But being able to heal and balance that's been a big deal. I've done a lot of it via dream work and dream analysis, um, and also there's like a simple way that you can do it physically and balance the two up. And it helps you get more center brained. So you're not just off in your left brain or just off in your right brain. Um, so you can just sit, um, sit nice and straight up, like on this uh, edge of your chair or edge of the bed or couch, and just, uh, just cross your shins one over the other. And people just naturally go right over left or left over right. So just look down and see which way you crossed your shins and then cross your arms the other way. So I naturally, my right shin goes over my left shin. So I'm just putting my left arm over my right arm, just like giving myself a gentle hug. And as you just sit up straight and just take a couple breaths, you're just balancing that masculine and feminine and then do it standing up. It's really good for your core um, and just you know get into, that, get into that position and then make sure you reverse it and do it the other way too. Uh, and it just, it just really helps with that. And then remaining on the path for me, a big part of it was being able to discover and do my best to live my life purpose. And life purpose, we can get so uh, forest, we, we can't see the forest because of the trees, we can get like so big with it. Life purpose should typically boil down to two to seven words. And when I see it again and again and again, and clients discover this during session as we're working with their higher self and guides, it may or may not correlate to quote what you do for a living. Um, I think that's kind of a common misconception um, that it has to, be, has to be that. But the most uh, boiled down one I hear the most often as life purpose is, to be love. And that one just comes up again and again and again. Or for other people, it will come through. And while I'm here this time, my life purpose is to be the most empowering parent I can be. You know, I chose to have this big family and that's what I'm, I'm really here for. Uh, or it might be to help other people wake up spiritually. That's, that's part of mine to help offer support in that area. So um, it's just it's just boiling it down and not uh, overcomplicating it, and then uh, trusting that and just 
being willing to ask for the resources if you need resources related to your life purpose. Uh, that helps a lot of people um, just really hone in and feel like they're getting it, getting it um, accomplished more. Because you have to have resources for certain life purposes. Any comments on that, Craig? No, I, I like your term, uh, loving someone from a distance. Maybe it's time to do that. <laughs> I like yes. That. I like that. Yes. Yes. Because that, that, you know, ferocious Fred, um, who's just gossiping and mean and nasty and just, you know, can't pull himself together by that water cooler. Um, just, you know, there's just certain people and energy we don't need to be around, as you said. Okay, so how did I progress? You know, so that's the, the third stage. I woke up, I maintained it, and then moving forward. Um, what I've found, th these are things that have worked well for me. One is strong focus on ego control. So I read things about ego destruction, and I don't think it's the same thing. <laughs> ego destruction um, looks at the ego as like it's something that needs to be removed, like an appendix or something. And it's, you know, I, I believe in your appendix, you know, even though it can be removed and you can still live, it has a purpose. It's a, you know, it's a detox organ. So same with the ego. It's there for something. And, you know, as Wendy said earlier in the broadcast, it's there to keep you from getting eaten by a lion or something. But, you know, some it, when it becomes overactive, then it is not helpful. So um, the idea is to is ego control. So don't, you know, doing a number of different exercises to stop listening to that monkey mind, to that voice in your head that's telling you to do things out of either that you're not good enough or that you're better than other people. It's taking judgment out of the equation, paying attention to the uncomfortable situations in your life and looking for, you know, what's causing the ego dis disruption. So, um, Forgiveness as medicine. I mean, Wendy just talked about it. Uh, for self-healing and healing of others, it, forgiveness is huge. And once you can, from the core of your heart, forgive somebody who did something, as, as you perceive it, did something, uh, then forgive that person. It stops the wheel of action or karma, as we call it, for both of you. So it heals both of you. That's the amazing thing about how that works. So, um, and here's another aspect of karma that I just found out about uh, that, you know, karma is there, you know, for, for reasons that are kind of ineffable, but it, it, they call it the wheel of action. So if you do something to someone, you harm somebody, there's going to be some difficulties coming up in your life. It's not necessarily a punishment. It's just, a, it, it's the way of balancing the energy out. And one of the ways that we all know of how karma works is you start having bad things happen to you, right? What we call bad things. You know, if, if you killed somebody in another life, then you're going to have bad things happen to you and, and, and so forth in this life. The, another way to avoid that or to pay your karma down in, in a more positive way is through good acts. That's my number three here on the slide. Service to others, as they define it in the law of one, it pays down your karmic debt without the suffering. So how about that? Isn't that a better way to approach karma? If you're concerned about your karma in this lifetime, if you've done what you think are bad things, now's a perfect time to just start doing random acts of kindness. Whether you even are concerned about your karma or not, it's good for you to do. Everybody's got something going on kar karmically speaking. Good acts are always a good thing to do. So now is a perfect time. Start being the change that you want in the world and doing good things. Uh, Is that and Mahatma then, Gandhi that said yeah, that? Mm -hmm. I think so. At the you know nowadays on the internet, I, I everybody from Abraham Lincoln to uh, you know Matthew McConaughey is is supposed. I know saying. you have to be really careful because right. quotes are misattributed all the time. Right. So. Um, Becoming a magical person has been my pursuit. I'm, I'm fascinated by people who have real magical powers, you know, who have really done it in, in, in the physical world in their lifetime. And I'm, I'm fascinated by reading about them. So, you know, for healing purposes and benefits to others, that's, that's the real, that's the good type of magic. Doing it for personal pursuits, that's called black magic. <laughs> so for your personal enrichment, you don't want that. 
Um, the, the good thing is realizing your you know, untapped human potential. Never stop learning and understand you, you are a magical person. Just like we said a few slides ago, if you want to put a protective orb around you, you know, look what happened to Wendy's friend. When Wendy did it instantly, her friend was like, wow, that she felt that barrier. Anything you imagine on this side of the 3D world happens on the um, energetic side. And once you understand that concept, you can start playing around with your own magical power. And then, you know, the final thing for me is just, I'm, I'm always a sucker for uh, looking for lost knowledge. I, I know and believe that there have been societies um, hundreds and thousands of years ago who were doing amazing things. And the proof of it is, you know, the, these megalithic structures that exist all over the world. They, Easter you know, Island. Yes, Easter Island, the Sphinx. Um, Pumapunku in Peru, there's all of the, you know, the plains of Nazca. There are these things that these so-called Stone Age people did with just hammers and chisels that, that people can't replicate now. You know, moving 100 ton stones around and carving them and, and placing them uh, without any mortar and they, you can't get a razor blade in between them. You know, that, that kind of stuff. So how did they do that? Well. They had some sort of knowledge and whether you want to call it technology or magical abilities, the, you know, there's books from a, the, the Book of Enoch to the Emerald Tablets that discuss these kind of things. And people who are doing archaeology in, in Egypt are finding uh, information on the walls in some of these pyramids and tombs that are they're not looking at them as myth, you know, mythical things they're looking at them as uh, let's let's look at this what what if this is what if they're giving us real information so that's i'm fascinated with that kind of stuff so um wendy what's helped you progress let's just uh, go back for one second greg so your your points about karma i absolutely agree with and as we raise our vibration and earth has moved up to the fifth spiritual dimension is, is my belief. And we can get on what's called the dharmic path. So rather than being on this eye for an eye uh, type thing um, with the karma, as Greg said, through, through the good actions and just doing the best we can, uh, you know, we're, we're up leveling that and we can certainly do that. And focusing on becoming a magical being don't most of us have Netflix? Uh, check out Merlin. Check out the series Merlin. I mean, he was considered the greatest uh, sorcerer of all time. And you just, it's a little bit of an unusual show because usually you see Merlin as this ancient, bent over old man, uh, timeless old man. But in the TV program, five seasons of it, you see him as a young boy trying to figure out what's right and where he should use his power and where he should not, all while trying to hide it because he's living in a society that puts people to death for having magic. So it's pretty, it's pretty interesting. So just, just wanted to, there, there's your, your interesting TV recommendation. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Check out Merlin <laughs> on Netflix. Right, cool. So what helped me progress? Uh, finding the right spiritual teachers at the right time, um, that, that expression, when the student's ready, the teacher will appear is very true. Because uh, I went through the thrashing about uh, stage, which I needed to go through. And I went through that for about three years, the first three years of my spiritual awakening. And I, even though I was reading some great books, I was just going through so many experiences and I had so many past lives coming through spontaneously. And every time I would try and heal one, like another three would come out. So I was just getting swept away. I was getting overwhelmed. So fortunately, about three years in, I found the right spiritual teacher and I was referred to her by a friend um, that I really, really respected who was working with the teacher. And that just made a world of difference to me. And I then worked with her for four years and it got to the point where she was just one of my best friends. And I was surprised when the teacher told me we'd had literally 
thousands of lifetimes together. So there was some, uh, there was so much good, but there was also some difficult things with it. And there were some things that were happening energetically that I knew weren't right. Um, for instance, very occasionally she would experience what I would call a psychic attack where low vibration energy was coming through and I would experience it too, or vice versa. And that made me say, gosh, I think we're a bit too open to one another or a bit too linked for that to be going like that. So I meditated on it and I asked my guides, what do I do? Uh, because I want to keep uh, you know, working with this amazing woman at this point. And they said, you need to put in um, a Chinese wall um, between you so that you know the, the, the good things, the right things are passing between you as you continue to work together, but other things will not pass between you. And because we were so psychic with one another, there was so much telepathy that was part of why we needed this wall because somewhat, sometimes one needs appropriate uh, privacy. So I did that and I let her know I had done that because I thought she's gonna feel that there's something different. Um, and then we just got to the point where it was time where she needed to, uh, push the baby bird, me out of the nest, because I was not going to progress as much as I should. Um, I was getting a little overly reliant on her. And so she let me know that we needed to wrap it up, um, and that I was ready to, uh, fly on my own. Um, and she just, you know, thanked me for the experiences we'd had and said, uh, basically, I'm, I'm letting you go. You're no longer able to be my student. And I was kind of like, what? You can get fired by your spiritual teacher. <laughs> I didn't know that was a thing. <laughs> and I really, it really hurt my heart. It just, but I was overly attached. So it just, it just took me some time. And as I said, it was slowing my progress. So uh, watch for attachment. Always watch, you know, if you think, oh, like, like if that ego part is coming up and you're, you're being a little bit of a drama, a drama queen, uh, we all do it. I was like, oh, you know, I can't live without her. I can't live without this help. What will I do without this help that just tells you I was overly attached? So it's funny now. It was not funny at the time. <laughs> it took me some, I had to, you know, re, rewrite myself from being, being kicked out of the nest, um, which I had just, my little birdie self had just, you know, gotten plenty big enough and was ready to fly, but just needed the, needed the little gentle boot on the butt. So I got it. So um, that's what I'd like to say about spiritual teachers, because I hear occasionally oh, I've studied with this guru or with this teacher for 30 years or 40 years, I'll never change. And I'm thinking, hmm, that's pretty unusual to me. I, I would really be looking at that closely. I respect free will. I respect that may feel right for that person if they still feel that they're really learning and progressing and you know both parties continue to feel really happy with it, that's great. But I've had a different experience and I've been blessed to work with um, a dozen different spiritual teachers over the last um, 11 or 11 or 12 years. So that, that's been a better path for me. So again, um, just, just be cognizant of that and choose, choose what's the best path for you. Same happens with communities. You can find some wonderful spiritual communities. I believe that's been one of the blessings of COVID as those have absolutely blossomed because Zoom just allowed us to connect with like-minded people in all parts of the world. Uh, so instead of you know, physically going to the meetup, and I love those, you know, being able to go to Wisdom Soup is one of my uh, favorite spiritual communities, which meets in Bellevue, Washington, but it's been on a long pause due to COVID. So it's been via Zoom. But that's allowed me to meet, you know, more people from other other uh, areas too. So as it continues to feel supportive, and you're learning from it, and you're able to share, that's fantastic. But again, uh, be willing to to change over time um, because it's it would be pretty. 
pretty pretty darned unusual, um, you know, to just just lock in with one and only one um, for your whole your whole lifetime. So, and also uh, doing doing the healing work, not only past lives, which I've referred to several times, but that ancestral uh, lineage, uh, the things that we have inherited from our ancestors. There can be many wonderful things there. And there can also be some pretty shocking uh, nonsense and crap, <laughs> just does not, just does not serve us. And there's there's things where we have to say, okay, I draw the line. It, that that ends with me. I am healing that. And as we heal and take responsibility for something, it just ripples out, and we're healing our own uh, ancestral line as we as we do that. And certainly um, our inner child wounds, we all have them. We're absolutely meant to. I believe we co-create them. Uh, we plan some of them um, because we know, like for instance, I needed to learn how to be more forgiving. Um, so we, we've, just, we've just got to do the work uh, as an adult to heal ourselves and take care of those things. And also we've all got a shadow self. So let's go back to my um, Merlin um, example of that, uh, um, what a lot of people see as, as fantasy and, and some of us have memories of that timeline of actually living in that timeline. But there were some definite um, shadows in that. Um, and uh, Morgana, she got to play the, the, the bad guy um, in that one and to be, the, to be the, the, dark, the dark witch. And she was a shadow to Merlin, who was standing in the light, uh, even though he made some <laughs> poor decisions when he was young, because, hey, we all, we all do. Uh, but just being able to embrace um, that part of yourself or being able to look at, you know, kind of those kind of those opposites that darken that light and just being able to uh, love and heal and, and take those places in. Because if you're denying it, if you're trying to chase it away, if you're trying to, you know, shove it away, your shadow's going to keep presenting more and more and more. Um, so, and so again, it just needs that, that healing and it can lead to some distortions. It can lead to some self-limiting beliefs and us not being fully in our power or living our purpose. And I really see that as, as, um, as, as an unfortunate, an unfortunate thing, um, you know, sure we can come back and, and do it again and, you know, chip away at it some more, but it, it's wonderful when we can, uh, live our purpose during the lifetime that it was intended for. Um, and that's something that comes up in sessions I do with clients as we review the past life and then go up to go up to the light and look at it from the higher plane. We're checking with their higher self and guides. Was the purpose met in that life? And if not, um, is there something that still needs to be worked on? You know, is there another, another uh, layer of it that's going on? And I have a new service, um, Practitioner Power Hour, because I do have a lot of uh, practitioners that come to me that are doing all types of wonderful healing services. And we can combine what comes up from past lives, what's coming up from uh, ancestors, what's coming up from inner child and shadow self, whatever is stopping uh, that wonderful practitioner from fully being in their power feeling healthy, feeling great, feeling they've got the resources they need, feeling they've got the happy relationship, whatever's tripping them up, we just work through in a very uh, uh, fast yet effective um, checklist way to, to take care of those things. Examining soul contracts and examining vows is just a big deal because we absolutely can have contracts that don't make sense anymore. Um, yes, certainly some of them can be ended by learning the lesson and finishing it up, but others just, they just don't make sense. And they're tripping us up and living our life now. Uh, same with vows. You know, we can have a vow of poverty. We can have a vow that's just too big for us. Uh, like feeling that, you know, we're in charge of landing peace on earth. 
um, and that we're the only person working on that. You know, a, a vow like that's just, it's just, it's not making sense. So, and then again, as I mentioned, the dreams analysis, that's been one of the big ways it's really helped me progress. Um, and I've worked with some different people in that area that have helped me uh, interpret my dreams. Thank you, Wendy. Okay, we've come to the end of our episode. And as Wendy said, we're, uh, we're going to have a broadcast in a couple of weeks on February 13th. Our next Waking Up Spiritually podcast, it's going to be about death. We're calling it Dying Lessons. How to die without fear, without regret, without grief. Um, you can check out, well, check us out on, on Facebook by doing a search for Waking Up Spiritually. If you're not part of our group, please uh, ask to be invited. It's a private group. You can also see all of our past episodes on wakingupspiritually.com if you click the broadcast link. And of course, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Again, doing that, go to YouTube and then type in Waking Up Spiritually in the search bar and you'll see some of our um, episodes. Click on one of the episodes and then click on the subscribe button. And uh, of course, if you're listening to this as a podcast, please rate and review us on Apple iTunes or any of the, the uh, podcast apps that you're, you're seeing us on. We appreciate that. You can see me at gregkirk.com. That's Greg, G-R-E-G-G-K-I-R-K.com. And wendyrosewilliams.com is where you can go view Wendy's um, practice. And you can also contact her at wendyrosewilliams.com slash contact. So thank you once again, Wendy. Fabulous. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you, Greg. Okay, we'll see you in a few weeks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.